Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. My name is Gabor Zinner, and I'm one of the organizers of Speakers Corner, a program which has come about through the effort of uh, individuals and organizations, too many to recite. I welcome you today to the second weekly session. Speakers Corner is a fresh air experience offering Calgarians an opportunity to address topical issues, exchange ideas, and enjoy the stimulation of fresh perspectives. Speakers Corner is a time-honored tradition practiced in many democratic centers around the world, most notably at Hyde Park in London, England. We are blessed to live in a free and democratic country where freedom of expression is taken for granted. At Speakers Corner, you have the right to participate in civic life by speaking your mind on topics about which you may feel passionate. You also have the right to just listen, enjoy, and evaluate the ideas that come forward. At Speakers Corner, you will be confronted with points of view diametrically opposed to yours. You will be offered the opportunity to challenge both an opposing view as well as your own assumptions about what is true and what is right. It is well to keep an open mind because we know that the heresy of today becomes the orthodoxy of tomorrow and the orthodoxy of today becomes the heresy of tomorrow. Galileo was excommunicated by the Catholic Church for the heresy of proposing that it is the earth which rotates around the sun and not the other way around. The notion that women should not have the right to vote or to own property was the prevailing ethos even in North America until much later. Because no one has a monopoly on truth, you are encouraged to be respectful of the speakers who come forward and the points of view that are presented. One of the admirable qualities of Canadian society is that we have developed a way of being able to disagree without being disagreeable. As a society, we advance through respectful dialogue and debate. This need not exclude passionate and heated debate. It should just be respectful. You are encouraged to attack the idea and not the speaker. During these Sunday afternoons, we will try to find subjects that are current, topical and controversial, kicked off by knowledgeable speakers who can present a point of view. As a speaker, you will have the complete and unfettered freedom to advocate and to criticize subject only to the following five exceptions. Slander and defamation, which amount to falsehoods that injure the reputation of individuals, contravene the law and will not be allowed. Statements or rants which offend against the hate laws of Canada will not be allowed. This includes um, hateful comments against identifiable minority groups. While the odd contextually appropriate expletive will be tolerated, a speech that begins to trend toward vulgarity and obscenity will be cut off. If you start talking about matters which are unconnected to the topic, which is the focus of the discussion at hand, the moderator will have the right to cut you off. Lastly, once you make your point and thereafter start to get repetitive, again, the moderator will have the right to cut you off. Every effort is being made to select weekly topics for discussion and debate that are topical, interesting, and relevant. We are also striving to attract one or two knowledgeable speakers to kick off each session. Today, we have a twin theme topic inspired by the buzz surrounding the, uh, the birth last week of the royal baby. Here are the topics. Should the Canadian citizenship oath require an oath of allegiance to the Queen of England, as is currently the case, or should it be abolished? Secondly, should Canada maintain or sever its constitutional ties to the British monarchy? Those who advocate maintaining Canada's current allegiance to the British monarch argue that Canada, as a nation and as a society, is what it is today only because of its historical evolution as part of the British constitutional monarchy. They argue that as a country, we have been shaped by our tradition and our history 
which is inextricably connected to the British crown. They take the view that our tradition, which includes having the Queen of England as the titular sovereign of our country, is part of our DNA as a nation. The proponents of the monarchist view feel that taking an oath of allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen as part of the citizenship oath is proper and fitting and that it is an affront to advocate the opposite. This point of view was strongly, indeed vehemently, expressed by Naomi Lakritz, a Calgary Herald editorialist, in her column published on July 13, 2013. I will ask Nina Polson to read it for you, just to provide the context. Nina? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out today. Um, I'll stop, uh, as she says, stop being a royal pain and get out of Canada. If you don't like the way things are done here, then why did you come to Canada? I really don't get it. I'm referring to the case that was heard Friday before the Ontario Supre Superior Court, in which three permanent residents of this country argued that the Canadian citizenship oath must not include any reference to the Queen. Take the case of one of the applicants, Michael McAteer. He said he is 79. He came here almost half a century ago, his affidavit states, taking an oath of allegiance to a hereditary monarch who lives abroad would violate my conscience, be a portrayal of my republican heritage, and impede my activities in support of ending the monarchy in Canada. He said his father suffered persecution back home in Ireland for being a supporter of Irish independence. Mr. McAteer, why on earth did you come to Canada then and stay for half a century? You must have known that Canada has strong ties to the Queen. Or if you came here and found out later about the words in the oath, why didn't you move somewhere else like the United States? Plenty of illustrious Irish people have gone there instead. Think of the Kennedys. Just because you are anti-monarchy and your family history is Irish Republican does not mean the oath should be changed to suit you. Leave the history of what you Irish call the troubles at home. The universe does not revolve around you. Then there's McAteer's fellow plaintiff, Dror Barnatton, 47, who came here 11 years ago and who believes taken, taking an oath to the Queen is repulsive. He says having loyalty is a bit much. Did you not think of this before you chose Canada? Did you not notice anything ahead of time or connect the dots when you saw references to such things as Court of Queen's Bench? Move someplace where, you, where they don't have royalty and you won't feel so put upon. What repulses, what's repulsive here is not the oath but the Barnatton's stance on taking the oath. Last, there is the third plaintiff, Simone Topi, a Jamaican who moved to Canada in 1978. She claims that as a Rastafarian, it would violate her beliefs to take an oath mentioning the Queen, because the Queen is the head of Babylon. Rastafarians believe Babylon is a degenerative society of materialism, oppression, and sensual pleasures, as a quick check with good old Wikipedia reveals. Which begs the question, why did Topi move to this degenerate, materialistic, oppressive, and sensual Babylonic place called Canada if she holds it in such scorn? I have zero patience with these people. Canada is the best country in the world in which to live. But if repeating a brief citizenship oath is so abhorrent to them, they can always choose not to live here. It is not like taking the oath means you have to do anything about or for or with the Queen. You don't even have to care whether Kate breastfeeds the royal baby, which was the subject of a lengthy and rather tedious article in The Guardian this week that I wish wasted my time reading. 
Take the oath and you never have to think about the queen again. You can keep all your loonies turned over to the side with the loon on it if you're that obsessed with the issue. But you don't have any right to come here where swearing allegiance to the queen is a tra tradition that dates back to confederation times. And then suddenly declare that the citizenship oath must be changed because you don't like it. These three argue that the oath discriminates against them and breaches their constitutional rights on religious and conscious grounds. I would argue that it is they who are discriminating against Canada's history, tradition, and national identity by trying to expunge a huge chunk of it for purely selfish reasons. They complain that because of their beliefs about the oath, they can't vote or get a passport. Cry me a river. Quit your whining and stop spitting in the face of Canada, which welcomed you with open arms when you came here of your own voli volition. Here's the federal government's succinct possession on the matter. The swearing of an oath to Canada's head of state has been a constant regard regardless of other legislation changes that have been made over time in the process for becoming a national naturalized Canadian. And, the government adds, it is not constitutionally inconsistent that the applicants who find Canada's foundational democratic political structure to be repugnant, at least in parts, are not accorded the right to vote within the political system. The inability to enjoy the benefits of citizenship, to hold a Canadian passport and to vote are amongst the costs reasonably borne by individuals whose personal beliefs run counter to Canada's foundation heritage. This is Canada, and the tradition of the monarchy is bound up with its history and identity. Love it or leave it. And if you don't want to take the citizenship oath, then leave Canada. You won't be missed. Thank you, Nina. Well, this is the pro-monarchist view, the pro-allegiance uh, uh, view. Uh, I, I wrote an email to uh, Ms. Lacritz on, on the day that this article came out, and I said to her that I, I read with interest your opinion on the Citizenship Oath published this morning in the Calgary Herald, and I invited her to uh, come and uh, propound her point of view, defend it. She chose not to come. She declined the invitation. So, in any event, um, there you have the pro-monarchist, pro-allegiance point of view. There is, of course, an anti-monarchist sentiment in Canada, which favors severing our ties to the British Crown. The proponents of this perspective argue that Canada cannot be truly independent as long as the ultimate repository of political legitimacy resides in a foreign monarch, where, for example, an act, all acts of parliament require royal assent from the governor, governor general, an agent of the Queen of England, before it can become a law of Canada. Uh, some people think this is outrageous, and that, of course, is the anti-monarchist sentiment. Uh, this sentiment is especially strong in Australia, where a national referendum will be held on the question. Perhaps the most forceful and eloquent uh, anti-monarchist sentiment that I've encountered was expressed by the American colonists in Congress uh, on July 4, 1970, 1776. Nearly 240 years ago, and I'm referring of course to the American Declaration of Independence, at least half of this document is consumed by a list of grievances against the king. To be sure, it was a different era, under different circumstances, involving a different British monarch, none of which speak to contemporary Canadian experience. Just the same, because of its moving quality and its historical importance and value, it is instructive and worth listening to. I would like to ask Nina to uh, read it to you.